just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So that's really an issue as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, to absolutely, to because I can't Something prove either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, citizens of Netlandia. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio. This is show 159, recorded Friday. Oh, let's see, July 14th. Yep, that's the day. 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go O'Reilly. Oh, I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I have with me, returning after a long sabbatical, Dan Atherton. Welcome, Dan. How you doing? Uh, glad to be back. Uh, as for doing constant... Constant physical battle, but hey, we're here. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you're here because you have you have an adept uh, grasp of the situation at large, and we'll uh, we'll see what we can dig up there. But you know, that's going to involve making some mistakes. We're going to break some eggs here, people. So if you find those mistakes, go ahead and let us know. Pause the podcast if you're listening to us uh, after the fact, or just uh, you know jot it down, jot it down right now, and send us a note at O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you really super can't wait, you got to get it off your chest, go ahead and call it in, 470-222-6759. I'd also like to thank our Patreon supporters out at www.patreon.com slash O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O. They are Donald Davis, Melissa G., Henry, and Daniel Duncan. Thank you very much for continuing your support. All right, so last week... Uh, I changed up the show a little bit, and I wanted to kind of put a little finger on the pulse of, of the world. And what better way to do that than to go with what we always say, which is follow the money. Right? So, last week we looked at the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and we took a look at the International Monetary Fund's basket of currencies. So, and also uh, the price per barrel of oil. Those are our big commodities. Those are the things that make the world go round, as they were. Yeah. So this week, the Dow ended up uh, closing. You know, we're Friday to Friday here, so it's as Friday closes. Uh, it is up $223.40 from this time last week. The NASDAQ okay. is uh, also up uh, $159.39 over last week. And S&P, which is Standards and Poor's, uh, that's up $34.09. So... Week over week, we're seeing things go up, which is, well, that's good for everyone, really. Hey, that's where, that's where my retirement is. That's where my 401k yeah. is invested. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see those numbers go up nearly whatever it takes to make them do so. Nearly. Not everything, folks. I'm not going to draw that line. But, <clears throat> uh, however, some not so good news for the dollar. The IMF Monetary Fund, the the uh, currencies in that basket, as a reminder, are the U.S. dollar, the euro, the Chinese yuan, the Japanese yen, and the British pound. Okay. Those are the five current most traded currencies, and thus the ones that are in there. Uh, U.S. dollar, I could pull up from last week and actually tell you the, um, the breakdown. It's interesting what they are. Um, in fact, let me do that. Because it's it's germane, and we want to remind folks that are listening. And so, eh, come on, come on, where's my note? I left myself a little note. No, really, I did. Come on. Okay, Google Docs is just being slow on me. That or I'm being much faster than it is. One or the other. Things are off to the side there. Come on. It's being slow. There it is. Okay. So as of 2015, this is when they changed. They do it every five years, so we'll see it again change in 2020 when they reevaluate this. The U.S. dollar makes up 41.73% of the IMF, uh, of the, the basket of currencies. Okay. Or also known as the, um, the SDX or the XDX, XDP, XDP. Um, which is the, it's a currency that's exchanged between countries. 
like when when a country has to borrow money from another country, they use this made up currency that is based on the IMF basket to okay. do the exchanges between countries. So there is nothing minted about this. It's a virtual currency um, based on this average. So U.S. dollar makes up 41.73%. The euro makes up 30.93%. The renminbi, which is the Chinese yuan, makes up 10.92%, which, by the way, was just added in 2015. It didn't even used to be there. And it already overtook the Japanese yen and the British pound. Not surprising. Yeah, so that, that gives you a real good indicator of how strong their economy is uh, blooming. Uh, Japanese yen is currently 8.33%, and the British pound makes up 8.09%. But now with Brexit, we'll see if they even make it <laughs> at no, all. No. I, I, I think it will still maintain, even with Brexit. However, I do believe they'll make up even less and less of the basket. Mm, perhaps. Uh, you may see it drop to, say, 4% of the basket. It all depends if another currency takes over. Like we might see, well, no, because we'd have to see another country exit the, the euro, exit no, the I, European Union. I, I just see it as gains by other things in the basket. Hmm. Yeah, possibly. I can, yeah. I can see, you know, the pound dropping. Uh, the euro possibly going up, especially considering some of the trade negotiations that have been going on over the course of the past month. Um, so possibly. The euro may, Euro may increase. Especially with the G20 uh, going on. Yeah, and yep. the yuan may increase. Mm -hmm. so. Well, right now, what's not increasing is the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. dollar uh, lost one cent off the euro. and uh, So one U.S. dollar will get you 0.87 euros, where it was 0.88 last week. Uh, the Chinese yuan, it's uh, now at 6.78, where it was 6.81 before. Japanese yen is also down to... 112.54 from 113.89. And we lost uh, two on the British pound. So that's uh, down to 0.76 Great Britain, Gr Great British pounds. The GPBP. GBP. Yeah, that's it. Where it was 0.78 uh, last week. Uh, however, you can get more bitcoins for US dollar uh, this week. Uh, one U.S. dollar will get you 0. 0.00045 bitcoins. I see. Whereas last week it was 0. 0.0004 bitcoins. <laughs> so a little bit up there, but obviously the, uh, well, that's great if you happen to be holding a bitcoin. Yeah, no, cryptocurrency is something to keep apprised of. That's why I've uh, added it to the to the list here of things to watch, because mm -hmm. it's uh, it is without a government, so yeah, supply and demand on that one. And then uh, oil prices, uh, oil price per barrel went up, so it went up well, uh, yeah. two dollars and thirty two cents per U.S. dollar. Uh, we're looking at the WTI, which is the like West Texas International on the uh, uh, New York Exchange, uh, yeah. NYMEX, so New York Market Exchange. And it's uh, currently at 46.54 cents. Well, part of that is because I uh, can't remember what oil producing nation just decided to go and do with the summer months reduce production. They got, they got approval, but they significantly scaled back. Yeah, I know there was something about OPEC, and I was watching been watching the fuel prices because um, I drive uh, oh, almost 400 miles a day at this point. And so I'm filling up my gas tank every day. So I'm watching the gas prices, you know, fluctuate up and down. And uh, today I was able to fuel up for $1.99.9. Just crazy. I haven't seen it that low in a long time. Yeah. However, I've also seen it uh, considerably higher in, in different parts of the state. So, again, that, that varies very much on uh, city municipalities and things like that. And then if we wanted to go look at, the, at our uh, new favorite uh, site here, not that it's new, 
it's uh, very, very useful. The usdebtclock.org, usdebtclock.org. Uh, U.S. national debt, as that number continues to skyrocket, is currently sitting at $19.963 trillion. Yep. That's a lot of money that we owe. Well, we can actually look at who, who we owe it to. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And remember, your Republican Party is a bunch of deficit hawks. They really are. Oh, well, I didn't know this number before. Student loan debt. Student oh, loan debt. Current, like debt that just simply exists. Oh, it's wow. It's higher than credit card debt. I'm not surprised. I am a little I bit surprised. surprised. I'm a little bit surprised. No, of course, again. it's the same people that have it. <laughs> well, he, he, wow. Th- th- this, this is something that I've been tracking for my, my during my time off it's been heavy in conversation mm-hmm. is just okay well I, I i don't know about you but i know myself when growing up we were sold this bill of goods oh yes where no you you go you get your degree and you're guaranteed a job right and then once you had the job that company would provide you health care it would provide you uh retirement benefits maybe a pension mm-hmm. even and you'd work there until you retired, and then you'd live off your pension for the end of and your golden years. Yeah, that 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 was the deal. That was the bill of goods mm-hmm. that was sold to me growing up. Even even after I graduated high school, it, it was it was still pressed upon me. And you were Not in just, a law enforcement family, so yeah. that's even even more interesting. No, it was it was pressed upon me. No, you go, you get your degree, you will get a job. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, two years in the pursuit of my degree. Mm-hmm. So 2004, things start radically changing economic-wise. Yeah. And it just kept getting worse. And here we are today. Yeah. So we kind of te- we did, we teased those numbers. We didn't actually tell you what the numbers were. So student loan debt. $1.461 trillion and going up all the time. Credit card debt, $1.014 trillion and going up. Yeah. Now, it's it's staggering, of course, that you know we could even go into the millions, but we're just showing you the trillions and billions of that number, and that's already staggering. It's not like our our little, you know, our Pleistocene brains that are, you know, used to wanting to just hunt and beat things over the head or any good at numbers. You know, you gotta be, you gotta be a special kind of person to be really good at these numbers. And, you know, we've, we've talked about like how many tankers, how many uh, freight containers of, you know, it would take to actually fill with hundred dollar bills to make, (laughs) <laughs> we, we've even gone with stadiums, yeah. folks. It, it yeah. is Olympic-sized pools. It's staggering. Yeah, remember that Scrooge McDuck thing? More. Yeah, much You'd more. have to have a much bigger vault to swim through. Yeah. Uh, ah, DuckTales. It's coming back. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't I don't know about David Tennant being Scrooge McDuck, though. I, I don't know. I mean, Again, he is Scottish, so it's if, okay. If, but... if he's not working with trying to put on in our accent the scottish is strong the scottish is strong yeah the scottish is strong with him uh so that's that's cool all right so that's um that's that's your numbers for the week uh stay tuned for next week and and i'll show you how the world burns or turns uh depending on how you want to look at it so but we will keep keep an eye on that because that's probably the best way that we can keep uh, a pulse on the nation and the world as a whole, especially with the global currencies. So if yes. if you think that there's a better way to do this or a better way to present this, I'm open to ideas. And all you have to do is reach out and touch us. Well, maybe not physically, but go ahead and leave us a ma- an email, a really radio podcast at gmail.com or phone it in 470-222-6750. We take text too, so if you're if you're totally voice shy and don't want that, because I'll play it. Um, 
you know, text us and, and we'll at least get the message. That's all we need, okay? Yeah, alrighty. So, last week was interesting because of the whole G20 as it yeah. continued to blossom and <sighs> Trump's daughter sat in for him on a couple panels, which was awkward. Oh. Again, I I can't stress this enough to to anyone who who doesn't think that this is significant. No, usually when somebody steps away from the table, you have a senior diplomat. Usually, in the case of the United States, it is our Secretary of State. Yeah, it would be Rex Tillerson sitting there. Yeah, it would be Rex Tillerson sitting there, uh, and should have been sitting there. Because mm-hmm. it's supposed to be your your senior diplomat, the people who who handle your your foreign policy. Since this is a foreign policy convention, right? They're the ones who are supposed to be doing their jobs, not insert random person here. Yeah, and and also since uh, since the G twenty was originally part of the essentially a monetary financial thing then it might not be even state department okay fine it might be secretary of commerce or something you know it, yeah there are many people that could take that place or at no you know, point is an unpaid family member in that list yeah no yeah you would expect okay secretary of commerce possibly yeah uh even with with the today's current climate and 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 the climate change debates which were and discussions which were had mm-hmm you, you could see maybe Secretary of Energy, yeah, be sitting down there. Uh, but these are supposed to be your your senior officials, not somebody who is an unpaid person within the White House, yeah. who just so happens to also be a family member of the president. That that does not play well on the world stage, right? That, regardless of what we think here. In the states, you, you you have to agree that you want the U.S. to present the strongest face possible on the world stage. I would have really thought that, and I didn't see her name mentioned anywhere at the G20. Was Nikki Haley, who is the U.S. permanent representative to the UN? I would have expected her to be in there somewhere. I it. it, it... <sighs> She's on the UN Security Council. Yeah, I mean, honestly, she could have easily sat in as well, and that would have yeah. been perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly Ivanka better, no, certainly better than Ivanka. Ivanka had no business doing it, and one well, again, there were some very telling photographs that came out of the G20 conference, and. I think it is safe to say that the United States is no longer seen on the world stage as the leader of the free world. We have ceded that seat. Now, yeah. fun historical fact, folks. And we like those. We like those around here. Um, for the longest time, again, Britain was seen as leader of the free world uh, up until their decline after World War II. Yeah. And they have never gotten that seat back once it was seated. We just seated the seat. So you're going to see essentially a, a similar, if not mirrored, decline that we saw with Britain after World War II here in the United States. I pretty much guarantee it. That might be an interesting, um, an interesting parallel to actually start drawing to really, really just kind of line it up. And see what happens. Because um, they were the global hegemon, if you believe in hegemon theory. Um, they yeah. were. It was Britain. And they were leaders of the free world. And then, well, they gave up that seat. Remind, remind our audience what hegemony is. Because, uh, like, again, that's going to be a, a recurring uh, vocabulary word for O'Reilly yeah. Radio. <laughs> um. You are, are, are the, the biggest, nastiest kid in the block with the biggest, nastiest war toys. That's to put it in, in the simplest terms possible. Is you are the boy with all the toys. You are yeah. the military might here at the table. 
And currently, the U.S. is the military might at the table. Right. However, we certainly don't have the um, the backbone. Well, I don't know about backbone, considering that backbone's out the window. We have mad, mad men and mad money at the top of, of so, our, our political food chain. So we definitely um, don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that you don't have to go back far no. is from the before before the results of our election last year uh china has been building up their military capabilities right significantly it, yeah the the statement is that they have the the largest standing military of actual physical people well, again, part of that's population. Um, that's just simple numbers, folks. Yeah. Um, but, no, they've been gradually building up their military might. They've also been, as we've seen over the course of just a decade, really, their economic might is being brought more and more to bear. And it's not just on the world stage, but more more narrow, specific places. You're, you're seeing them reaching out to... Um, developing nations in Africa and the Caribbean and, you know, buying their debt or uh, putting in infrastructure projects in these places, developing relationships with these developing nations um, yeah. and, and buying up global debt. They are becoming a, a economic juggernaut and they're using that economic power towards military power. Now, in hegemon theory, it's eventually one overtakes the other through a violent conflict, or a violent conflict happens and tests the hegemon, and either they meet that challenge or they diminish. Now, one of the things that we are seeing is more and more the United States gets involved in conflicts that it doesn't put an end to. Oh, we have, we have, we're very bad at exit strategy. No. We're, we're very good we're, at dipping our toe in the water and then falling face first, but then we never come back up for air. Yeah, as, as of really since Vietnam, um, we've been taking a more and more, well, well it, it's now a, a definitive U.S. approach. I would have referred to it as a French approach to, to military conflict, where... Hi, we get involved and then terrible things happen. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of an American thing. Yeah, I, I blame um, the CIA. But that, that is becoming more and more the narrative. And with what's happening with places like North Korea, we're seeing, again, we're, the, the face of war has changed. We're not fighting conventional wars anymore. Especially That's... not when you talk about a country such as North Korea. Um, interesting analysis no. that I heard today. Um, was it today? I don't know. The days are blending together. But uh, this week, at the very least, um, is that really North Korea is nothing to, to even worry about. Um, it would be the only thing to worry about is the stability of the person on the trigger that he's building up not a big deal because really it's about whether or not china would actually pull funding because if they do then they're going to have a little country of starving people who are all ideologically bent on something or other because that's how they've been conditioned over a lifetime. And what are you going to do with them? Well, th So then they'll have a giant crisis on their hands of humanitarian uh, consequences, or the people themselves were, would simply riot, and then there'd be dangerous things that could happen from an entire population like that. Um, the same thing with South Korea. South Korea is probably better off with them just staying the course. Otherwise, they'd have to somehow absorb North Korea. Well, right now they're they're with their recent elections and the the their 
the current people in power in South Korea, they're very much for let, let's sit at the negotiating table and and smooth things over. Let's have a better dialogue here. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. I don't even know what to call that haircut. Um. But the <laughs> captain of it is. Uh, very, very, it's at least seemingly unstable. And yeah. more unstable than, than his father, at, at the very least. He's more um, immature. Also, I would say violent. Well, sometimes peace comes through maturity. You know, it, it is very often that a childish mind will first go to violence you know little kids on the on the playground they'll exert dominance they'll push people they'll knock them over they don't care they they have not yet developed their full empathy abilities and you often see it with silver spoon kind of people a distinct lack of empathy for people around them again especially the little people struggle breeds empathy um but no, there's there's definitely the, this this sense of North Korea is less safe with it, it, its current leader, and I yeah. know at least from what's coming out of South Korea, they really want to get people back at the table, just just talking, at the very least, have a dialogue. Mm-hmm. Our current leadership over here in the states doesn't seem to really care. Uh, we've heard repeatedly from the White House that North Korea is China's problem. And the White House is of the opinion that China should handle it, uh, which is a divorce from previous policy that has been held for quite some time. Um, yeah. It has been very much that we have seen North Korea as a global issue. And that we want to be at the head of that table dealing with that issue. Could it be the international, the, yeah, international conto, con, intercontinental ballistic missiles? Yeah, ICBMs, a term that we haven't had to really use or bandy about uh, very much in recent times. Except for now, since apparently they've got one or two, or at least the ability to generate them. They, they, it is seemingly that they have the ability to uh, create a stable enough rocket for it to go from North Korea to hitting Alaska. Yeah. That, that, that is what we're talking about. It's, it's not like ours or Russia's capability of being able to go from D.C. to Moscow sort of thing. Um it's it's more of it's a short hop, but it's enough of a short hop to hit U.S. soil. Yeah, but is it's it's then you know to use the same lingo, it's also then another short hop to create a better one, and they have been doing incrementally better. Rockets. Yes, yes, they have. So at this point, we'd have to say, okay, they've got one. What is the purpose behind creating? nuclear weapons that can reach out and touch someone, especially a global power or the neighborhood hedge money? Uh, that's that's an excellent question. I can't put myself in the, the mindset of North Korea, except that... Bargaining. Ha- having... Well, part of it's bargaining. It, part of it's also to resist, as, as at least the White House has acknowledged, mm-hmm. regime change. Uh, right. Nikki Haley, going back to her, she's actually stated mm-hmm. this. Um, is that as much as we want North Korea to de-escalate and de-arm, the reason that they're escalating and arming is because of the United States' recent habit of regime change. And Recent as in like through the 1980s? Well, <laughs> hell, just, just, just we love back, to do that kind of thing. Just, just going back to Libya. Yeah. Okay. Where, you know, their leadership ha- was strung up, drugged on the streets, hung, shot, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
that's that's the current view of the globe of the United States and the view of North Korea. So why should they de-escalate? I don't think that they have a reason to remove it. Because if you... Th- what it does is, yeah, it has, it has... They have got all the reason in the world to do it. Really. And no one is there to stop them. Because it, what it does is it legitimizes their threat. It puts on the big boy pants where then they feel like they can sit at the table. And they can push to sit at the table. So therefore, a country that is starving could yeah. then use that as a crowbar to get into talks of alliances. Easing mutual, sanctions. Mutual defense alliances, easing sanctions. All sorts of things. Because basically it, it gives them something big that they can then say, well, I can put it down. All you have to do is this and this. And I want it in writing. Because otherwise, the next thing that I'm going to do is chemical weapons. You know, it's it's a very thinly veiled threat. And one that can be used to great political use. Because we've seen it with, you know, countries like India. India and Pakistan. Israel. Yes. <laughs> Israel's another matter. Israel is a lot of different things, but yes, they do have nuclear weapons. Yeah. We can't no, ignore is... that they have that. <laughs> no, I- Israel is its own bag of wax with its current regime. Yeah. And Iran. We've just seen recently with Iran, you know, and and all yeah, but the things the Iran that we've... deal actually is working. Right, but it didn't it was had no chance of working until they had working weapons. It's a bargaining chip to get a seat at the table. So I really, what it could have as a knockdown effect is a stabilizing influence on the region. I know, it's weird. You get a big nuclear weapon, but what it does, instead of destabilizing and causing unrest, what it does, and it's been argued several times, I'm not the only one to come up with this idea, is it stabilizes the region because of the potential for devastating effect. Because other countries are less likely to use their big weapons in fear of retaliatory strikes. You know, that whole mad thing, mutually assured destruction. Obviously, it's a little one-sided because North Korea is small. It's not going to take much. And then, and they don't have much to work with. So really, are you going to glass North Korea? <laughs> because that's what you have to do. It's going to look really bad because the rest of you is going to be fine. Because there's ramifications for the winner in that engagement. Yeah. Do, did you win? Or did you snuff out a guy? And all of his innocent people. There's humanitarian issues involved there. And the weird thing is we're making China deal with that yes. kind of thing. It's it's the current White House policy that, it's again, it's China's problem to deal with. And China's like... Do we care? Does China care? China doesn't really care. No, no China cares to a degree, but China's been taken off guard because yeah. for the longest time, North Korea has been the redhead stepchild. It's been, yes. we can do all our human rights abuses because there's this North Korea thing over here. Yeah. Um, but now, wait, wait. S- s- seriously? Now, now we have to deal with them? Oh. We, now we have you, to get our act together. You've, you're getting, you're leaving the table. Why are you leaving the table? What, what, what is, right. oh, good gods. But do you see what, <laughs> do you see how that could then be a stabilizing influence? Because uh, it, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to give the Trump administration credit for simply backing away from responsibilities that we've dug ourselves into. I don't want to do that, and I don't think that a head-in-your-sand nationalism, you know, just let them do it, and we're not, nope, everything's just uh, closed borders. What is, what is the term for that? I can't remember. 
isolationist? Isolationism. Yeah. Yes. Um, that seems to be the route that the Trump administration is going very heavily is isolationism. Yeah, but- Except, of course, where Trump hotels are uh, involved. And since he doesn't have one in North Korea, he's not going to be caring about it very much. So, Again. so yeah, he's going to he's going to see see the responsibility for upstart little nuclear nations to other nuclear nations. Let them deal with it. We'll just be over here building up our military so that you still can't come through. You still can't mess with us, but you can go ahead and deal with them. It's an interesting tactic, and it's definitely yeah, but, a business tactic. It's not a political uh, tactic. But at, at the same time, one of the things that previous presidents understood. Yeah. And th- this is it, this is going back even to you know Reagan. Even even Reagan understood this. Yeah. Is if you cede your place at the table, you don't get a say in it. Yeah, he's okay with that. He doesn't want to say in it. He literally does not care what happens to that continent. But you should be care because by doing that, you are giving China more leeway and more cachet mm-hmm. with the entire region. He not, loves China. Not just, not just, not just North Korea, but you're you're seeding our influence with South Korea. You're seeing our influence yes. with Japan. You're yes. seeing our influence with all of Pacifica. Yeah. He doesn't want it. It's isolationism. Yeah, it's not just it's not just seeding that country. It is seeding the rest of the world to the rest of the world. He doesn't want to be involved in it. At yeah, all. but that means that you're going to get bad trade deals. That means that you're going to hurt your your nation economically. Well, he's going to try economically to stay involved, but militarily, he's isolationist. They're hand in hand. He doesn't. He doesn't know that. Who did he hire as the Secretary of State? Another business guy. Everything is business. It's that's all it is. It has nothing to do with the politics. It has nothing to do with the power. Is just all he uses the the military power for is to wrestle a deal. He's going to use it as sanctions. Deals. It's it's the carrot and stick thing. That's all he's going to do. Yeah, but I'm not even cer- certain if this man knows what a carrot is. The carrot for Donald Trump is I won't sue you if you do what I ask. I mean, yeah, it's a weird kind of twisted thing, but I don't know any other person in history that has had as many lawsuits as he has had. He's over 4,000 lawsuits individually. And the Taj Mahal just, you know, started selling off all of its assets. Yeah. Oh, I'm not even talking about how how poor his business acumen actually is, but as far as uh, his litigious nature and using using the government, using rules as blunt force weapons is something that he has a long history of, and something that I think is is what we're seeing in some of in his handling or mishandling of global economic policy. Again, this is just going back to my point of, you know, we've, we've seated our, 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 our seat at the table. The only thing that's keeping us as the hegemon is military. Yeah. And, but he is deliberately seating not just one seat, but almost every seat we have at the table gradually. I don't think he wants really to lead. I mean, I know that the the whole "Make America Great Again" thing. That that was just a slogan. It is a slogan, but he likes slogans, and and the more often that he says a slogan, the more often that he thinks like that. It's a weird thing, if you've noticed, that you know, if he says something long enough, he'll believe it. He's not only lying to the to us; he's lying to himself. So you're comparing him to McCarthy. 
I think that's an apt comparison. I don't think that that's a stretch. I mean, I I don't I no longer have the patience to continue to attack him. I'm simply analyzing him and trying to figure out what he's going to do based on what I've seen and based on other history. So in in taking his the way he deals with people, the way he deals with companies, the way he deals with business and money and his life as a whole, I think we, we get a pretty decent picture of how he's going to do things. So here, it's, here's in, here's a one one thing. In his uh, divorce proceedings with his mm. with one of his wives, I, I think it was his first wife. Um, during the negotiation at the table with all the lawyers, you know, you lawyer up, definitely big lawyers. Um, they were about two hours into it. And he simply got up uh, at kind of a lull and walked out of the room and didn't tell anybody where he was going. He left for two hours and then came back as if nothing had happened. And by that point, everyone was so angry, including his own lawyers, that they wanted to get out of there, so they settled. That's the kind of thing that he's willing to do with the law, is to play the emotional cards and everything, and make people make bad decisions on his behalf. So just, I mean, it's all there. I mean, these are, they're public cases. You can see what happened in many in many of these scenarios. Uh, in this particular case, it was one of his lawyers that recounted the story about what happened. <laughs> so just keep watching and it's it's plain to see how he's dealing with things. You know that if he had a great speech, he didn't write it. Because all his his chosen mouthpiece is Twitter, 140 character blurbs at a time where he'll trash people like the Morning Joe uh, crew. Yeah, Scarborough and Mika. Yeah. Uh, about, about a facelift that, did she have it? It doesn't matter. He said it. That's oh, now... I, it just, he lies so much. I mean, we... we yeah. It, it's getting to the point that, you know, PolitiFact and... Yeah. Is just getting tired. Exactly. Exactly. And he is relentless. He can lie faster than you can fact check. It's it's called the gish gallop when you just trash you just blurb a, a hundred different things that may or may not be true, but by the time you get through with all of them, if you haven't addressed all of them, he's won in the eyes of his constituents. Well, eyes of his constituency is an entirely different subject, which is a, a psychological quagmire. You want to talk about swamp? Jeez. It's weird. It is so weird, and I don't understand it, but really, it they don't respect facts. It's a very much well, kind of a cult of personality in many ways. And some of them don't even like him, but he's so unlike everyone else, and they hate other people more than him. Well, it's so weird. Getting getting more to, to Trump country... Yeah. Um, and our current health healthcare debate, uh, lovely thing coming off the wire not too long ago about a lack of doctors in rural communities. Yeah. Right now, uh, if things keep on the current trend there are, there will be a 4,000 doctor uh, deficit for rural communities across the nation. 4,000 physicians. Yeah. Huh. And more and more rural hospitals are closing because we do for-profit medicine. Yeah. There's there's no... There's not a, 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 a big amount of money to be made serving a rural community. 
which yeah. is where most of your your Trump voters come from. Right, which is, is why you've got, uh, which is why large uh, public health communities are um, uh, not communities, but centers, um, health department, you know, the county health department, et cetera. Why those are really the most popular in rural communities. Because they're they're not there to make a profit. They're there to serve the country. Yeah, but even those are closing because there's not people willing to staff them. Yeah. Well, that also comes down to being a civil servant in many cases. And, oh, look, they're not getting raises. Oh, look, their pension just went away. Yeah. It, you know, it, it doesn't pay to be a civil servant anymore. That used to be a cushy job to work for the government. It used to be a great job. Yeah. Um, but hell, that started going down the wayside uh, all the way back to Nixon is when that started going south. Yeah, because they started busting labor unions. They really came down hard on labor unions. And labor the Republican unions, Party hates labor unions. Labor unions are the reason that we have a five-day work week. Labor yep. unions are the reason that you guys get a forty-hour maximum. You know, a forty-hour full time anything over 40 is overtime you know i mean that and those are those are that. negotiated through labor unions they were not you know just granted by the by the wonderful people that you elected no 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 they were fought for people died for this stuff yeah and it was people who were in labor unions and we're seeing them being trounced again and again and again mm -hmm. now there are some unions that have taken a little bit, taken it too far. Some that have taken it too far, you know, Teamster unions, and you know when you go go back that far, and that's that's the thing that, again, it's institutional memory. It's like that one example is the thing that's always going to be brought up because it somehow is always true to them, even though it's old news, doesn't exist anymore, hasn't been that way for a long time. Yeah, you know, they'll they'll drive by a construction site and see five people standing around one guy digging a hole. That's the problem with Leonians right there. Look at that. They don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't know that that one yeah. guy digging the hole is the specialist. They have no idea. And the ER guys are waiting for the hole to be dug because then one of the guy, those guys is the electrician who knows what to do down there once right. the hole is dug. But he doesn't know of how about digging safely and not electrocuting himself. Yeah, could be any number of things. <laughs> any number of things. Or it could be that um, the hole's only big enough for one guy. Yeah, there could be that too. You know, I mean, you sure, could you put more people in the hole? Yes. Would they all be killing themselves and not being working efficiently? Probably, yeah. But there's a lot of, There's a lot of that going on where people see a little slice make up a story about it and it somehow makes them feel comfortable while demonizing the other people now going more on to the the back to the world stage oh yeah i suppose uh, we got to deal with that <laughs> do you think a lot of where we're seeing gas prices and how opec's uh recent actions uh is a reaction to uh, our, our favorite not Tony Stark and the the new Tesla? Mm, no. No? Not okay. so much. Because it really, that's that's a blip on their radar. I mean, it's, it's a blip that they are going to continue to watch because eventually um, an anomaly can become a trend. So they're going to continue to look at that, but... When you're just looking at crude oil prices, think of all the things that you make with one barrel of crude oil. Gasoline, Fair. gasoline is King. is is part of it, but there's plastics. There's you know you you not only are you creating fuel, you're also creating uh, diesel fuel. You're creating jet fuel. You're creating kerosene. You're creating all these other other things, and yes, a lot of those because I know that there are some people out there that are you know, really big on chemical engineering and know what happens as you refine oil, uh, where that that one barrel will actually become all of those things at different stages in the process. Some of them are runoff, essentially, from a different process. You're trying to get this thing, and that is a byproduct, and yet you can still sell it. 
you know, a barrel of oil is an insanely useful thing. That's what we've come to know it as. And that's why it's so valuable. It's not just gasoline. But gasoline is a, is a big marker. And strangely, you know, your gas station, you know, they, uh, they didn't get a new tanker truck in the day when they had just changed the prices over. The market changed, and then they changed the price on the board. They're making different profits on the oil that they've already purchased. It's a weird thing. And it just drives me bonkers sometimes. It's like, why are you charging me more for something that you've already paid for? You're already getting the right amount of profit out of it, but there's be- money to be made. Because so they the can. market keeps shifting. Right. So, essentially, you know, your, your gas stations around, they're buying on a prospect. You know, part of their profits is buying it low and selling it high. A gas station itself is a small microcosm of a stock market. They've bought an oil commodity. Yeah. Buy low, sell high. So while it's in the ground, they bought it at, I don't know, 99 cents a gallon. They're going to sell it for $1.10. Then there's going to be taxes on top of that. Because that's pretty much how it goes. And it goes up and up and up. And if there happens to be a tax increase or anything like that, well, they, they've they got the oil already. They're just going to charge that out to you. So that's going to change the fuel, fuel pump prices. It's a weird thing. And if you really think about it, it'll just make you angry. So probably shouldn't think about it too much. Makes me a little angry every time I fill up. That and that, you know, dollar ninety nine uh, and nine tenths. Yeah. And nine tenths. That's that's an old holdover from um I think the early refining days. And I don't know why they held on to it other than just to make it seem like it's one cent cheaper. Even though it's only a tenth of a cent cheaper. And do you know of anything else that you buy on a day to day basis where you're paying tenths of a cent on it? No. No. It's only it's only gasoline. So, so if you have a story about gasoline and uh, maybe a little history rant or anything like that that you'd like to share with us, go ahead and email us, Podcast at gmail.com. Phone it in, 470-222-6759. Well, we've, uh, we've talked about, uh, about the world a lot, uh, though we There's haven't really made any on. headway. I mean, it's, it's almost like we're just bitching about it. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, that's that's kind of what we're here for. We're here to bitch with you folks out there. Uh, these are the conversations that you are probably wanting to have, um, but sometimes about different uh, different avenues. So if you would like to change the conversation, you just have to ask us. But otherwise, we're just going to bitch and rant about what we want to. And these are the things on our mind. Was there anything else out of the G20 that uh, that caught your eye? Uh, the G20, aside from, you know, uh, a amazing eye roll by Angela Merkel uh, towards Putin. <laughs> she's, um, she's getting good at that. She really is. <laughs> no, no. I, again, I can go on about Merkel for a while here, uh, considering everything that's happened uh, since the start of my absence to, to now. Uh, again, some amazing photography just showing how isolated the U.S. has become, especially at, our leadership. Um, but no, the other people have thoroughly covered a lot of the stuff coming out of the G20. The most notable thing I want for our audience to, to, to note and to see and to, to ruminate on is the rest of the world is going to hold up the Paris Accords. And yet yeah. we have a president that that gets his feathers ruffled if we even mention climate change. It's a reality. We just had an iceberg the size of Delaware break off from an ice shelf. Yes, I was looking at that um, 
actually just before the show, I was watching the NASA video time lapsed over several years of the last part of it caving off. Um, it is a trillion ton iceberg. It's large enough. It has a name. I mean, it's like How? C. It's like C A one or something like that. Yeah, but, but it has a name. It it is identified, uh, you know, all by itself, because yeah, it's the size of a state. I wonder where it's going to go. You know, I mean, it's big enough we can watch it from space. We can watch an iceberg from space. That's how bad it is, folks. Okay, there we go. Um, <sighs> I went on a little rant um, this week, actually, about climate change. And about how people don't understand uh, complex systems. And... The environment, the ecosystem that we are a part of is a very finite and complex system. With complex systems, you eventually end up with something called a cascade. Where, you, I mean, you, we've all done a cascade effect. We've all played with dominoes. Yeah. We've all done a domino run. And then when you get bored, you make bigger domino runs where they hit a, a couple dominoes and then those dominoes hit other dominoes. And then you spread out into this big pattern. Uh, one of the best ones I've ever seen was uh, in the movie V for Vendetta when he tipped over the one and it just spread all the way around. Yeah. It was a, a gorgeous uh, example of that. The problem is the environment can be the same way. And with climate change in particular, there are a lot of moving parts that can lead to really a runaway greenhouse effect. Methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It stays around longer and it is simply more effective. It doesn't dissipate as quickly. I think it's like 10 times worse, 10 times uh, more effective as a greenhouse gas. I'm, I'm not certain, but I know that it, it is a great, great insulator of heat. Let's see. Methane versus CO2. Okay, there we go. Hello, Google machine. Uh, while carbon dioxide is typically painted as the bad boy of greenhouse gases, methane is roughly 30 times more potent as a trapping gas. I was I was wrong. <laughs> oh dear, I was wrong. And that's out on Science Daily. So that's that would be a, a nice trusted source at least by scientists. Not necessarily climate change deniers <laughs> that is. Jeez. But okay. So methane uh, cows produce methane, you produce methane, I produce methane. Farts. Also, a lot of it's yeah. uh, locked up in permafrost. A lot of it is locked up in permafrost because it's from decaying matter. Other methane sources would be landfills. Decaying matter creates methane. Methane smells bad. It's not an odorless thing, thankfully, because um, at least we can detect it very easily. But it is more potent. And we generate plenty of it. It also makes a, a handy, um, you know, because we can burn methane as opposed to carbon dioxide, which we cannot burn. It's already a byproduct of being burned, essentially. Um, so we can use methane to fuel things. You know, we've had that for a long time. But the problem is, yes, the permafrost is no longer so permanent. So things, trapped vegetable or animal material... As it continues to decay, it will release methane. If it's no longer frozen, it will release that methane. It's no longer sequestered. Not only is the permafrost one area that methane is very high, also down at the bottom of the seafloor. There's tremendous methane sources that are locked there. From, you know, imagine all the, all the fish and everything that have died and sank all the way to the bottom. 
plenty of things that have then been covered over by silt. And Lord knows what else down there. Lots of bad things. Yeah. So we've also noted that as the ice melts, the albedo of the globe changes. It's no longer as white or reflective. And, and uh, if, you've, more heat. if you've ever gone outside without wearing a, a nice lighter colored shirt or a darker colored shirt, you know exactly what's happening. You're absorbing more of that heat. You're getting hotter. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, article just came out where they're thinking of painting all municipalities' roads white just to help keep places cooler. I would hope for a light gray because white would then, then you'd have a whiteout condition and you'd be blinded and then you'd have accidents. So that wouldn't work either. Lots of tire tracks too. That would just be ugly. White would be a bad idea. I, no. But no white heat. roads. No white roads. Less heat? Sure, less heat, but I think you could do that with just a, just a light gray. You know, doing the blacktop, that's a bad thing. But as we notice, even the blacktop bleaches out over time and turns to a light gray. You know? Because asphalt even, eventually turns to a gray color because it's been bleached by radiation. Uh, it's absorbed all that, and now it can't do anything. So... But as that is, okay, so the ice melts, all right. Then the, it can't reflect as much heat, okay, so then more heat is retained. Okay, that's, that's bad, so we've got that. It's combining. That's not releasing more heat. That's adding more heat to the system. It doesn't have anywhere to go. It's trapped, okay? Then the methane is released from the permafrost, no longer being so permanent. It was all under that ice that's now exposed, okay? So, more methane, more heat. Okay, that makes it even worse. Then the oceans, they raise in temperature just a degree or so. You know, just overall. But that changes all the way down. Oceans are a huge heat sink. 80% of the world covered by water. <sighs> that water eventually does heat up all the way down to the bottom. And then... More methane is released, methane is released. And, up and up and up and up it goes. Another side effect of having the uh, ice caps go away is that it changes the shape of the planet. Because the weight of the ice is gone, therefore the tectonic plate underneath it no longer has the same mass characteristics. So the mantle can push up. What happens when the mantle pushes up on volcano on thin areas volcanoes tectonic plates can shift rather dramatically when such things happen because pressures are released pressures move and a large chunk of ice melting faster than say an ice age is rapid very rapid in when you're talking about tectonic plate movements geological ages it's very rapid if you just lose all the ice. So we have that going on for us. And then you've got, oh, uh, let's see, plenty of volcanoes and things like that that are spewing ash. Releasing even more carbon into more the atmosphere. More everything into the atmosphere, yes. And then causing things to warm further. Over and over and over again. So it becomes a cascade effect. This affects this, affects this, and they all affect each other, and they all magnify the effect. And we're there. We're the, the domino has already been, been tipped over, and we get to watch. Because there's nothing that can stop this. There really isn't. I'm, I've been as optimistic as I can. There's nothing that can stop this. It's going to take time because the world is a patient place. It's just going to do its thing, and it's going to take however long it takes. We're very bad at these estimates. We don't know how long it's going to take. Some of it, you know, depending on the cascade, it could be very fast. And I keep seeing numbers where it gets worse an awful lot faster than anybody previously expected. Because they start taking into account things 
like I've said, the albedo changes, this changes, that changes. All the ocean water that is now higher moves towards the center because it's being spun around. So the shape of the world changes, which could, I guess that would actually speed up or slow down our day. It's going to change the amount of time that the Earth faces the sun. Little things like that. Also, we're looking at a extinction event. Oh, we're already we're already involved in that. We're we're on the sixth major extinction event that we can count, and you know we're a part of it. Whether or not we survive through it, that's that's a, a great determiner. Will we survive the sixth major extinction event, and how will we do that? Because. Okay. You know, areas are slowly going to where the water is going to rise. You know, in some areas, even the tide has an enormous change, just hourly. And in other areas, eh, it's a few inches, no big deal. Not a big deal. Up north, it's actually really significant. You know, on the northern latitudes, you get a really crazy shift in the tides. Oh, yeah. But down here, an entire castle that's based around a tidal flat. It yeah. uses that as its historical, you know, deterrent for being raided. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. So, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to live? I mean, we're going to end up then with climate refugees. We've already started. Yeah. We're, we're having small island nations that are disappearing as we speak. Yes. We, we are also, also seeing out here in the U.S., in our, our in the southwest areas that are getting so hot mm-hmm. that they may no longer be able to support microbial life for part of the year. Wow, microbial life. Yes. So we're dealing with extremophiles are the only things that are going to be there things that are specifically for adapted. Round. Yeah. Yes, things that are specifically adapted to that environment. In, in Arizona uh, in places in Arizona in Nevada, New Mexico, we are seeing temperatures so high yeah. that they will no longer be able to support microbial life. There was a um, <laughs> there was a, a, a plastic fence, you know, those PVC fences. Oh, yeah. That was in Arizona. It was a decorative one. It was one of the really high price models. Really nice. Melted. Oh, yeah. Uh, it looked a, like there was a fire next to it, but no, it was just melted. No. Industrial, like, uh, re- the recycled plastic, the, the heavy, hard stuff yeah. that was made into a cross had just bent over, melted in the Arizona heat. Yeah. Yeah, mailboxes that were made out of the rigid yeah. plastic, they were just bleh, drooped. Yeah. Uh, street signs, the... Uh, the plastic paint, the you know, the vinyl that would be used yeah. to create the that just, off. Yeah. Bleh, just melted off like uh like Belloc in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Just Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's just but that's we're we're seeing the effects of climate change right now, and yet we still have people who are going, No, it's not happening. They they are very confused with with what weather is yeah uh, weather's daily yeah. climate is slow it's the average it's the average it's like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, in the latest Cosmos uh, he he had a wonderful illustration of that which is a guy walking his dog along the beach yeah oh hang on there's a random there we go okay I didn't want to hear that there we go um the guy walking his dog up on the beach. The dog is going everywhere. Yeah. But the, that's but the man that's with the leash is walking a straight line. The man is climate. The dog is weather. Going all over the place, but still following a basic line. And that line is where the climate was going. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a brilliant observation. That's really, that's the way it is. 
So that's the cascade. It's it's happening. Doom, 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 gloom, doom. And more doom. I. If I'm wrong, we all win. And I'm pleased with this. If I'm right, then we need to do something. If I'm wrong and we did the thing that we were going to do, we still win. If we fail to act, we all lose. That's the thing about climate and and doing things for a better planet. If you don't do anything, then you lose because everything's going to go downhill. If you do all the wonderful things, you know, switch to electronic electric vehicles if at all possible, switch to renewable resources whenever possible, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, you know, the 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 standard things that we've hopefully been doing for a long time, you know, switch You've to more efficient for, devices. Forever. Yeah. You know, even switching from, you know, a an a, a pr- predominantly animal protein diet to a vegetable diet, that does help as well. Of course, it all depends on where you're getting things. Big complex systems, this carbon footprint thing. But there are things that we can do, but we need to do it as a whole. We all need to pitch in and do the things, and we're very bad at doing that. But if we don't, we lose. If we all do it, and I end up being wrong, if we all end up being wrong about climate change, what have we done? We've simply created a healthier environment to live in. We still win. We still win. <laughs> There's, we just do it. And, and uh, here's another thing for, for our American audience, for, for some perspective. Mm-hmm. Whilst our government is trying to do everything that's possible to go against the, the Paris Climate Accords, it seems, let's look to, again, as we, we th- this may as well be a China episode. Let's look to China. Let's look to our our, our the the rising hegemon, the the our economic rival. They're featuring uh, featuring prominently in this episode. Yes, <laughs> they are. They are actually taking steps actively. Their government is actively taking steps to mm-hmm. try and sequester the carbon that they are outputting. They acknowledge that they are putting out so much carbon and are affecting the climate that they are investing in not just diversifying technology investing in solar and wind and uh hydroelectric which is something they've been doing for a while now right but the the very act of of doing a dam building a dam uses so much concrete that the concrete itself is a pollutant yeah generating greenhouse gases and everything like that but they're moving. They're they're moving towards I, uh, with this one Panda Electric company, which is cute because they do their large electrical fields, and make it in a shape or to appear to look like a panda. Uh, and that's <laughs> look. It's a hidden Mickey. <laughs> it, yeah, but, but the uh, ears are uh, lower. <laughs> uh, a hidden Mickey you can see from space. Um, they're they're they've already set up two fields they're they're planning on setting up four more but before uh before second quarter of next year Hmm. so no they're 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 investing in diversifying their 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 energy consumption but they're also doing other things like planning on having these large vertical gardens in I just their, found I just found a picture of that. Yeah, that in is major adorable. City it's, centers. it's the 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 panda thing. Yeah. It's not just a panda head. No, it's the whole damn panda. Yes, that's impressive. I wonder if and I they're can going, show they're that. They're planning on having six of these, the pandas. But but they're planning on having vertical gardens for their city centers to 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 soak up all that carbon dioxide. Uh, huh. We're seeing also our. Our, our friends to the south in Mexico for a lot of your uh, raised roads on the pillars, putting up ivy, stuff to absorb the carbon. Also, uh, it's a beautification project. These are things that are being done by other nations. Why are not we not doing them? Yeah. Here, folks, here's, here's what the uh, panda thing looks like. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing. Seen from space. I mean, it's a that's a big panda. <laughs> that's a really big panda. <laughs> yeah. And it was a a 100 megawatt solar power plant in the shape of a panda bear. Panda Green Energy is the company. Yeah, and they're going to build more of these. It's crazy. Crazy and they're awesome going to be able to through the diversification of their energy be able to sell it to their neighbors. They are enriching their nation oh, by doing this. Apparently that was a that was a false photo. Yeah, that was a mock up. That was a uh, yeah, that was not it. However, Snopes acquired a drone photo of the actual farm. Oh. And it is here. Still a big panda. That's still a big panda. That's a big panda. An actual photo of the panda power plant in Datong, China. That's really amazing. Um, yeah. That's cute. Yeah. So, good stuff there. Good stuff. Uh, you know, I, I don't really care if China does... I don't care if they beat us to the punch. I no, don't, I don't care, care at all. but I yeah. I think it should drive every every patriotic American batshit nutty to see China get the jump on us. What happened to American exceptionalism? We should be number 1, right? I suppose there's an exception to American exceptionalism. <laughs> and it's climate change apparently. <laughs> But we should be number one, okay? Well, we are number one in so many things. So, so many terrible, terrible things. things. <laughs> it's not the good stuff. We used no. to be number one at the good stuff. Now we're number one at the bad stuff. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, we should be pushing for, you know, stuff that, that okay, for every single sci-fi nerd out there, what, don't we want to, to, to reach that, that, that science fiction, not necessarily utopia, but that 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 greater society, where where we we are better as a species, and pushing for better technologies, wiser technologies, uh, exploration, doing the right thing. Also, on an economic sense, uh, diversification never hurts. True. Monocultures die in fantastic ways. You know, we've, we've seen that with, you know, entire species collapsing. Um, here's, here's a concept, and one that I struggle with. In many science fiction books, the end is near. You know, something horrible is going to happen. And there's always people complaining about how they're going to pay for the solution to the end of the world. Right? Yeah. And here, we have the same thing. How are we going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? It's the end of the world. At what point do you just do the thing? No one can cash a check if you're all dead. At, at some point, a, a, a fiat currency limitation on resources should not be the thing that holds back a species from saving itself. So in this regard, China, communist government, yeah, they can just do the thing. Because they say, do the thing. Yeah. We're all going to be Chinese. <laughs> because they're the only ones that, that live because they did the thing. Well, they're not the only ones. It's, it's also Scandinavia, certain yeah. parts of Europe. Uh, but also, you know who's really beating all of us? African developing nations. 
Yes, because they've skipped an entire technological segment that we had yeah. to get there. To they, yeah, they're they're skipping standard industrialization. Going so the world's ending, right? Oh, so what technologies do we need to be adopting? Let's just adopt those. Yeah, let's, let's just let's go straight. Let's just go straight there. Yeah, what's our carbon footprint? Negative something or other. Cool. What, let, let's make it even bigger. Negative numbers. Yeah, and and that's the thing. That's the thing. As negative Nelly as I've been. And, yeah, I, I can get plenty negative. I haven't even been to full negative yet on this. Okay? I, I can go deeper. But I'm not going to. In order to fix it, we had to stop producing greenhouse gases 10 years ago. So... All of these things with the Paris Accord. Let's reduce our greenhouse output. It's not enough. No, we have to be taking carbon out of the system. Exactly. We have to, you know, reducing it to lower numbers, that's wonderful. It would have been great 30 years ago. But now we are at a point where you have to be carbon negative. It's not producing carbon. You have to take it out. And it's other nations that are developing the technologies to do so. Right. We're going to be buying from them because we haven't invested as a nation here. Right. And who's going to produce it for us? China. Uh, China, Sweden, mm -hmm. Mexico. Yeah. These well, are the nations that are developing these technologies. China's going to be the one that produces it because they have the largest manufacturing capability. Yeah. So they're going to be the but, ones that are going to generate the carbon sequestration machinery that is yes but the patents might be owned by the swedish or right. the mexicans yeah but the but the chinese don't really care about patents they just make the thing how many knockoffs come out of china it doesn't matter fair they're, enough they're gonna that, that's a fair ex analysis yeah they're gonna profit on it it doesn't make any difference um but but even nations like india are starting to move towards trying to make themselves carbon negative we have terraformed the planet in a bad way in a bad way, yes. So, at least not not for our species. We have terraformed the planet for plants. We have not <laughs> we have not done it for us, and not even well for plants. Eh, they'll they'll be fine once we're all dead. They'll be fine. <laughs> no uh, problem. Fair. Yeah, uh, we've made it great for algae. It's wonderful for algae. Oh, it's the algae could kill us. But again, I didn't want to go there because it gets worse. So I didn't want to go there. <laughs> now. As it does get worse, though, the only thing that ever initiates change is those cataclysmic events. We, the refugees, yeah. we are best in horrible situations. People die. Things are lost. A lot of collateral's gone. Entire areas will not be, un be habitable anymore. But eventually we will all be on solar. Fusion will happen. We're getting really close to that. And once that once a room temperature kind of fusion happens or something or other, whatever, as as long as fusion's happening, we're then going to take away the coal plants first. Then we'll take away the nuclear plants. Not the nuclear plants are fine. It's just a matter of figuring out what to do with the waste. Really That's a big question. Yeah. No, really we can just put them in capsules and have Elon send them to the sun. That's gonna happen at some point. That, that would be great, though yeah. I have a feeling we'll put them elsewhere in space before we get there. Actually, you know what we could do? Turn them into another energy source. Use Consume the, them? Just use the byproducts to do something else with them. Eventually, something like that will come, come along. That's one of those entrepreneurial things, one of those leaps of technology what can that, we make with all this waste? Yeah, it's like, we got all this crap. What are we going to do with it? Okay, well, we'll it, figure out something to do with it. It's like what's happening in India where they're going, hi, what can we do with all these plastics that are just, you know, polluting everything? Oh, we can turn them into building materials. Let's just melt it down, turn yeah. it into recyclable, you know, freaking blocks, yeah. pressure treat them, and then use them as building materials. Any number we can of even set them up like Legos. I would, I would, I want giant Legos like that. They, they make them now. I know, I, I want them. I would, I would build giant things in my backyard out of giant compressed adult-sized Legos. 
Uh, anyway, get, get on that, guys. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so just what's going to happen? The only bright side I can see is that the silver lining to all this is it's going to get so bad, someone's going to come along and be brilliant and figure out a way that we can just have a, a freaking windmill in the sky that also happens to suck carbon out. It sucks methane straight out of the atmosphere. Well, we don't have anything for methane. They are developing ways to get carbon out. Well, yeah, I know. But, but, but the thing is, carbon has been the devil. That's the thing that everyone was against. That was the target. Yeah. The real problem, though, the 30 times larger problem is, is the methane. methane. Methane can be used as a fuel. Sequester, though. But methane can be used as a fuel, and then it breaks down into other things. So it's if you collecting can, it then. So if you can collect it, capture it, use it, and then as a byproduct, then sequester that, then you you get to a point where you end up being carbon negative. So it's a two pronged approach. You have to take it out of the atmosphere and then you gotta put it away. So somebody has to figure out how to capture it. Another person has to figure out how to store it and put it in the ground somewhere. Oh. You know, Methane plants have been storing harm. carbon. Plants have been storing carbon for millennia. Yeah. Actually, that's the the biggest solution right now that I'm I'm seeing just coming across with different technologies is high. Um, let's use hydroponics and certain forms of of uh, botany agriculture to get the best plants for absorbing carbon and come up with architectural means of just distributing them throughout our major cities. You know, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay, so out at uh, in Habitat, which is kind of a, a liberal left-leaning site, um, but also it has a lot of like, hey, this is a cool thing that we can do that's good for the planet, blah, 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 you know, all that fun stuff. Apparently, uh, one of our favorite products, at least one of my favorite products, is hemp. Because good rope. It makes great rope, it makes great fabric, it makes great building material. Yes, it, hempcrete is amazing. Hempcrete is amazing. So apparently, it ends up being carbon negative. What? Hempcrete is carbon negative. Because you're sequestering carbon in the hemp Ooh. and turning it into a building material. You're sequestering it into the building. Hmm. Um, so apparently, uh, let's see, now there's a new building material that's not just carbon neutral, but it's actually carbon negative, developed by UK-based... El Hoist Group, uh, Tradical Hempcrete, is a biocomposite thermal walling material made from hemp, lime, and water. Very simple. Mm -hmm. And this, August 4th, 2009. Why aren't we using it everywhere? Yeah, that would be a... That uh, let's see. So buildings account for 38% of the CO2 emissions in the U.S., according to the U.S. Green Building Council, and demand for carbon neutral and zero footprint buildings is an all-time high. Now, that was in 2009. Okay, so it's only gone up from there. We knew this was a problem. We've known this is a problem. And we still continue to make things bad. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, apparently, there is more CO2 locked up in the process of growing and harvesting of hemp than is released in the production of the lime binder. So, of course, the equation is more complicated than all that, but hempcrete is still an amazing technology that could do some, some great stuff. But, of course, here in the United States, what are we not allowed to, to grow? Hemp! Hey, there's a state of emergency in Nevada because of a lack of, of, of marijuana. But it's a different plant. 
Yeah. It's a totally different plant. But man, I mean they're I, they're they're genetically rela- genetically related, related yeah, but, but hemp different. doesn't have THC in it. But it's a weed. It grows like a weed. We could yeah. easily grow this stuff. Uh, Good-looking, environmentally friendly, and 100% recyclable, Hempcrete is as versatile as it is sustainable. It can be used in a mind-boggling array of applications, from roof insulation to wall construction to flooring. Hempcrete is waterproof, fireproof, insulates well, does not rot when used above ground, and is completely recyclable. In fact, the manufacturers say that demolishing Hempcrete walls can actually be used as a fertilizer. Well, yeah, it's lime and hemp. Apparently, it's been available in the UK for years. Yeah, instead of all that, you know, flammable cladding, how about we use hempcrete instead? Yeah, the species of hemp used to manufacture hempcrete is illegal to grow in the U.S., making hempcrete an expensive option for U.S. builders for now. And it still is. However, Europe has got their heads out of their butts, and they, they're allowed to, to use hemp as a building material. So that's why you don't see it here in the United States. Because reefer madness. Really, that's... I, we just... It's such an amazing building product that we... If you're not part of the solution, there's money to be made in prolonging the problem. But there's more money to be made with the solution. That's my problem. That's why my head can't wrap it's around all this nuts. Entrenched industries. Diversify and survive. But they're they they've already got a stranglehold on an industry, so they're gonna Diversify they're gonna just and strangle and just squeeze out every little drop of money they can get out of something that they've already got. Guys, I, get, I know, I know. It, it, it's it's an economic problem with an economic solution diversity makes it so that your company survives cataclysms it makes it more profitable you know what would allow these companies to survive a higher tax rate oh yeah Uh, push them towards reinvestment that's right because that's what it does folks it doesn't make it doesn't penalize anybody well except for the board of directors perhaps you know the big c level guys that get enormous profits it would force them to put any excess profits right back as reinvestment into the company and one of the wonderful things that we've seen that do was bell technologies like the bell labs yeah the think tanks research and development the reason Lockheed Martin's Lockheed Martin is because of the tax rate under under Ike. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in their best interest to do that anymore because now they can just immediately siphon the profits off the top. Yeah. It makes the wealthy wealthier. And it makes the makes company the poor poor. just it makes the company just kind of keep on going in, in a straight line. They don't really deviate, they don't change. You know, they, they stay entrenched in whatever business model they happen to have. The only real changes, and I've seen this in so many industries, is you get the entrepreneurs out there, the the venture capitalists, and they generate an amazing idea. Rat, just rapidly generate that idea. And then they get bought up by another company. And that's how those other companies are doing their new stuff. How they're changing yeah. the world is by buying other companies that already changed it and then rolling it into something that they're already doing. Yeah, we really need to revisit Teddy's antitrust laws. Yeah, but not under this administration. No, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen not just under this administration. It's not just the White House. No. It's, it's federal and state levels. Perhaps under Dwayne The Rock Johnson for president. Honestly, I don't know his politics, so I cannot say. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Apparently, Kid Rock is also putting his uh his hat. He's thinking in. about uh, state uh, senate for Michigan. He's not. He's not looking good. Do you see a, a recent photo of him? No. He's not looking very kid. 
he's looking more gray like rock, but he's not looking kid anymore. He's he's definitely uh, that time has passed, man. Put that hat away and get a haircut. Now I sound old. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but he's not looking so good. He really isn't. <laughs> like the Fresh Prince? Not so fresh anymore. That not so Fresh Prince feeling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think that, uh, that that should probably wrap us up. I think uh, yeah. you know, dropping on that is probably the best thing I can do. <laughs> Oh, what a terrible joke! Uh, but that's what you all all have come to expect from me, and you know I I don't want to disappoint you. So there you go. Alrighty, so let's see here. Uh, where's the end? Ah, there's the end. All right. If you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash O'Reilly Radio and get early access to show content when life permits. I know I'm late on the last show, but it'll get out there. Also, make the algorithms work for us by reviewing us on iTunes or wherever you happen to find us. That'll boost our ranking and get us in front of more eyeballs. And use your words. Tell somebody about us. That always helps. Word of mouth advertising. It's worked for decades, centuries, millennia. It works. And, of course, engage with us directly. Send us a message on the uh, social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or, if you're the more talkative sort, there's 470-222-O-R-L-Y. That's 6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what you we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, the Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you and your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work license under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pimgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. And, uh, hey, why don't you talk to your representatives and uh, give them a little lesson on cascade climate change theory. Yeah, try that. Nah, it probably won't work. But, hey, you can try. Always try. All right. See you guys next week. Toodles.